Good evening. Welcome to this evening's edition of Tisky Sam. My name is Aaron Bastani. Thanks for joining us. Today we have the immense pleasure of being joined by Anthony Lowenstein, who is the author of, I won't get this wrong, uh, the recently released Pills, Powder and Smoke, Inside the Bloody War on Drugs. Great to have you on. Thank you for having me. How are you keeping? Well. It's been four years since you last came on to discuss your last book, Disaster Capitalism. It was. Late 2015 we talked about that and issues have only become more relevant since, I'd say. Yeah. Sadly. Absolutely. But now it's drugs. Now Although, it's drugs. Drugs and disaster capitalism. Although no, there's a great deal of intersection over the two there books. There is. As, as our audience will soon find out. There is. Before we kick on any further, yeah. um, I'm just going to introduce the, the topic with this excerpt from the back of the book. Uh, if we can just grab, the, grab this up. The war on drugs has been official American policy since the 1970s. With the UK, Europe, best a failed policy, according to best-selling author, Anthony Lowenstein, its direct results have included mass incarceration in the US, extreme violence in different parts of the world, the backing of dictatorships, and surging drug addiction globally. And now the Trump administration is unleashing diplomatic and military forces against any softening of the conflict. Pills, Powder and Smoke investigates the individuals, officials, activists, victims, DEA agents, more of them in a second, and traffickers caught up in this deadly war. Travelling through the UK, the US, Australia, Honduras, the Philippines and Guinea-Bissau, Lowenstein uncovers the secrets of the drugs war, why it's so hard to end and who is really profiting from it. Um, so we've already mentioned your last book was Disaster Capitalism. It's not a great leap from that one to this one, but what spurred you in particular uh, into writing a book about the, the war on drugs and its failure? You know, over the years, I was often frustrated with the fact that people would look at, say, the US and they'd say US states are legalizing cannabis and therefore it's inevitable the drug war is winding down. Or they'd look at, say, Uruguay, which legalized cannabis. It was the first country in the world to do so. And therefore, sure, there's violence in Mexico, but generally the drug war is something from the past. That's back in the day. The truth is, I guess I wanted to challenge that idea and go around the world to some of the key places where the drug war is most ferocious. And also, as often my books do not have, and that was something I wanted to change for this one, is to give people some hope. Often I think investigative journalism books are pretty grim. Well, the issues that I write about are pretty grim. And in this case, I'm not giving false hope, but I talk about there is a shift in some countries towards either legalisation of some drugs a change in public opinion towards, say, psychedelics, ecstasy, LSD, magic mushrooms, and an idea that drug policy doesn't have to stay mired in this crazy, violent, US-backed paradigm, despite the fact that there's still massive amounts of drug war violence around the world. So I wanted to challenge people's, I guess, perception about that. And... Yeah, I guess I also wanted to go to certain kinds of places that m many journalists and most journalists don't go to. Was there a particular event? So, so you, your book came out, Disaster Capitalism in 2015. Mm. Obviously, authors are always looking for the next big thing. Was there something you looked at? Was it, you know, what was going on in Mexico with the higher rates of civilian deaths? Or It was tail end of Obama, actually, in a way. I can't remember if there was one catalyzing moment, but tail end of Obama. Obama, as I say in the book, but the first term of Obama was basically business as usual, following very much Bush and President's past. Second term, there was a shift and not radical by any means, but a shift and at least a public acknowledgement that the drug war had been disastrous and he moved to try to release people for non-violent drug offences who were going to be dying in prison. And I met two of those in the book, um, American men, African Americans, they had committed crimes, yes, they'd been dealing, one had been entrapped, <coughs> and they were released, otherwise they would have died in prison. And it was incredibly moving to see that. I'm very critical of Obama on a range of issues, including in the book. And he did far, far not enough, but it was something. So I guess I was catalyzed. And of course, back then, I think when the book started, Trump wasn't really a likely option. And we can talk about this later, but Trump actually, on one level, has not changed things as much negatively as many of us feared. Domestically in the US, there was a thought that, well, as he'd threatened, and Jeff Sessions, his first attorney general, mm. had threatened that all these supposedly liberal progressive drug policies were going to be changed or curtailed or reversed. That hasn't really happened. In other words, there was the threat that they would send federal authorities into, you know, a Colorado cannabis bar, which legally they have every right to do. Still, didn't and why happen. why is that? Although we're going to more detail on that, that yeah, later. Yeah. later well, federal, why is that? Federally, at the moment, in the US, most of these drugs 
namely cannabis and others, are illegal. And during Obama, uh, a lot of states started to legalize cannabis. And there was a choice that the administration had to make. Are we going to prosecute these um, states and try to go after them? Or essentially almost turn a blind eye. And it was acknowledged that they were doing it. And they chose, in my view correctly, to leave it open to say that this is happening step by step, stage by stage, state by state. So even though marijuana is, le- uh, is legal in California or Colorado, Indeed. it's still illegal federally. Absolutely. And the majority of states, cannabis remains yep. illegal. And if the federal government wants to override what was they going can. on in these states, they could. They could. And that was the case during Obama. That was the case during Trump. Jeff Sessions proudly said this is one of the key things he was going to do. It didn't happen. I guess he was too busy doing lots of other crazy shit during his time in office. And Trump had also threatened. So during the campaign in 2016, Trump had talked actually about not wanting to mess with states' rights. Um, as I said, fast forward to four years in this election campaign, which we can get to later if you want. But bottom line, Trump has actually not done that much to screw with those kinds of states doing that. And this year's election in November, many more states have it on the ballot. And it's quite likely that more states will legalise pot. And this year, for the first time, not all, but a lot of the Democratic candidates for president, more so the progressive ones, the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warrens, Biden is not so good on this, but others have talked about, if not radically changing drug policy, changing it a lot. Uh, For example, uh, they're talking, some of them, about legalising cannabis federally, which would be great. Uh, Reparations for drug war issues, which I think is a key issue, including here in Britain. The idea that if you end a drug war, reparations, which which can mean a range of things, but giving support to the communities that have been most negatively affected by it. And uh, other candidates, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, she won't be president, to be sure, but she's advocated legalising, regulating all drugs. Um, Mayor Pete has also talked about decriminalising all drugs. In other words, these are different ideas that in 2016 were not seriously yeah. on the agenda. It, now, looks like, it looks like Pete Buttigieg, I think that's how you pronounce his name. I mean, Buttigieg it looks like, something, yes. Yeah, it looks like he's going to be the, the moderate candidate of choice if Biden falls away. It's either going to be him or Warren versus Sanders. Looks Looking that way. Yeah. So basically, that's to say that, that this issue around decriminalisation has kind of hegemonised the Democratic Party, more or less. And that's been amazing to watch, you know, Aaron, because 10 years ago in the US, public opinion about cannabis, for example, was almost the opposite of what it is now. The majority of Americans did not support legalisation of cannabis. Now, pretty much across party lines, yes, more Democrats than Republicans, but generally speaking, most Americans, and indeed most Brits, according to polls, support legalising cannabis too. It does feel a bit further away here, but we can talk about that later. But yeah, that's to me encouraging and bring it on. So let's start from the, the top with regards to this issue. When did the war on drugs start and what were the politics behind it? Officially the 70s, Nixon, we'll get to that in a minute. But look, in many ways, this has been going for 100 years. And that started in parts of the US. It was a war, it was a race war in a way. The fear that was articulated by politicians back in the day that back then Mexicans were coming over the border, bringing their awful drugs and seducing white women. That was the rhetoric and it was written that way. And similar in other countries around the world, in the West. In Australia, for example, which I don't live there now, but that's my birth country, that the, there was a fear that the Chinese were coming, bring opium, and they were going to seduce white women. You're seeing a bit of a theme here. So there was an idea of either li- uh, criminalising either those immigrants coming to the country, in the Chinese case, or Mexicans trying to make it more difficult, or making the drugs somehow the demon, and therefore that they were going to ruin white women particularly. It's very racialized and very gendered. And you also talk about it in the Third Reich. It's a big theme there about the sort of... Absolutely. <clears throat> the racial other, rather than it being the black or the Latino, it was the Jew. The Jew, indeed. And I mean, the Third Reich was a sort of weird contradiction. I mean, most people maybe don't know this, but there was massive propaganda by the Third Reich against Jews who were essentially ruining society for a range of reasons, including infecting the society with drugs. On the other hand, the Third Reich... Um, from Hitler down, were massive, massive uses of uses of drugs, methamphetamines particularly, um, both given to soldiers on the front across <laughs> Europe. But Hitler down were drug addicts. I mean, there was a book a few years ago which talks all about this. It's quite remarkable and not that unique in a way that you have conflict after conflict after conflict 
Second World War, Vietnam, Iraq, now Afghanistan. I just spent time last year in Nigeria looking at how tramadol, which is a legal opioid, is increasingly used in abuse-grade strength by Boko Haram, given to kids who are kidnapped to unfortunately force them into doing horrible shit against civilians and animals, etc. So the use of drugs in war is pretty common. But fast forward to the 70s, Nixon called it war on drugs, that it was important to fight this war to stamp out the drug scourge. But it was framed <coughs> very much years later, and there's a quote, and I have in the book, I'm not the only one who's used it, by one of Nixon's former advisors, and I'm paraphrasing words to the effect of, we knew we wanted to go after the anti-war left and blacks. And this was a great way to do it. We could go after them by criminalising the drugs that they were using, throw them in jail or break up their um, groups. And they had pretty good success on that, to be honest. Carter, Jimmy Carter comes in, talks about liberalising, didn't do much of a job. Reagan accelerated and pretty much since Reagan, and obviously nothing ever goes in a straight line, but in many ways, Obama was the first president that really tried to far from enough, undo some of that. So the rhetoric about the drug war still, I'd say, in 2020 is very much racialized. There is still a sense that the way that laws are um, used and abused disproportionately affects people of colour, and including in the UK, of course, and the US. This is a shame I didn't get that quote up, actually, about <laughs> uh, what you're saying about its role. Yeah, read uh, it out. Yeah. Uh, this is from um, Nixon's domestic policy head, John Ehrlichman. Said decades after the Nixon administration. Yeah, um, this is about the Nixon campaign in 68. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. Nixon's domestic policy head, John Ehrlichman, said, You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night in the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Uh, and that's from John Ehrlichman. You've cited it uh, here in the book. And there's also a quote from, from Nixon at the top of the introduction, which I find remarkable. That's a, yes, read that one. The anti-Semitic <laughs> quote. Yes. Quote, every one of the bastards that are out for legalizing marijuana is Jewish. What the Christ is the matter with the Jews? I suppose it's because most of them are psychiatrists. You know, yeah, Nixon wasn't a big fan of Jews. I mean, that's kind of the, the psychiatrist thing, at least. Is, I mean, yeah. it's kind of, kind of funny. He was talking mainly probably about marijuana and heroin there. But yeah, uh, Nixon, yeah, what can one say? <laughs> but there, yeah, so it's really intriguing. There's this very clear um, connection between uh, the war on drugs and a clear political project which is, is itself an outgrowth for racialized other, mm. but seeking to reproduce that racialized other for political means. And it has been unbelievably successful. Successful meaning not in terms of human rights or decency. It's been unbelievably successful in destroying generations of the poorest in the US, African-Americans, whites, Latinos, disproportionately in prison for often low-level, non-violent drug offences something that Obama, as I said, was trying to undo a little bit. And Trump has not really done anything to try to address that. I mean, there's one piece of legislation weirdly pushed forward by Jared Kushner that has tried to deal with some of this in a weird kind of way. But in general, the rhetoric, I mean, Trump is a big supporter of Duterte, the Philippines leader. More of him, surely. Indeed. So anyway, yeah. But um, the drug war is <clears throat> still very much alive and well, hence doing the book. So the book itself covers <clears throat> a range of places. Uh, Honduras, Guinea-Bissau in Africa, mm. uh, the Philippines, Australia, Britain, America. What, why did you cover the particular places that you do in the Global South, aka um, Honduras, Guinea-Bissau? Yeah. Why not Afghanistan? I mean, that's the classic it is. narco state. It is. It's a narco state and uh, a few reasons. One, I felt that some of the reporting of there had been pretty good. Not that I'm saying I've been to Afghanistan twice for work on disaster capitalism for the book and the film. Not saying I couldn't have brought anything different or fresh to it, but I thought it had been done fairly well by <clears> some <throat> journalists that I respected. And Honduras, for example, barely gets reported on. It's a key country where most of the cocaine going from South America into the US goes via that country. Huge amounts of coke. I mean, the amount of coke, and we'll get to, I guess, the amount of coke being consumed in the UK these days, but the amount of cocaine in the US is massive, huge, growing, soaring. It has to come from somewhere. It's mostly 
Colombia and Peru, predominantly Colombia. So Honduras has become, and Honduras for 100 years has been a US client state. Since the Reagan era, clearly it's become a key staging post to fight Reagan's anti-communist jihad. Fast forward to more recently, there was a coup in 2009 supported by Obama and Clinton, Hillary, um, sent the then Secretary of State, and the country was in bad shape before then. Since 2009, the effect has been a devastating change in that reality. Narco president, narco government, narco mayors, and I have quotes in the book from activists who are fighting this, who said this problem didn't start in 2009, but it's massively accelerated ever since. For example, abortion's been outlawed entirely. Obviously, abortion still happens, but it's incredibly dangerous to do so. And all the violence in Honduras, it's one of the most violent countries in the world, out of traditional war zones. It's not Syria, it's not Afghanistan. Very violent. And, of course, what I didn't really predict when I started doing it, and as it turned out, it was quite prescient, Trump comes in in 2016 and the reality of Honduras is that so many of the people who are trying to get into the US as migrants, refugees, are coming from Honduras and they're fleeing for a reason because I spent time there and spoke to communities across the country and they were saying, you know, I've really been to a country where virtually everyone you meet is dying to leave. Not because they hate Honduras, because it is so (coughs) dangerous, so unsafe. So petrifying. You've got a quote here from, in 2012, the US State Department estimated that 79% of all cocaine trafficking flights leaving South America for the US first landed in Honduras. So That figure probably has ebbed and flowed over the years, but it's yeah. pretty it's accurate, yeah. Yeah, with 90% of cocaine passing through Central America and Mexico. Important to say before we go on to Guinea-Bissau, the, mm. sort of the main way of getting it up into North America, quite understandably, is through yes. Central America and Mexico. Totally. And, then, and historically, to get into Europe, it would have been through the Caribbean. Indeed. This has changed. It's changed. And now it's going through... West Africa. West Africa. Hence why I went there. So briefly, Guinea-Bissau, tiny, tiny West African country no one's heard of, really. Former Portuguese colony, independent in the mid-70s. Basically, it's become not the level of violence you see in Honduras, but the majority of cocaine going from South America by boat and plane into Europe and the UK goes via West Africa now. And that's countries like particularly Guinea-Bissau, but also Ivory Coast and others. And Guinea-Bissau has become a narco state. Now, I talk in the book about whether that's a legitimate term. The UN called it a narco state. I think there's something slightly, there's an element of neocolonialism about that term. But nonetheless, there's no doubt that various elements of the state and the military are controlled by narcos. South American drug cartels essentially have bought off virtually every element of that country. And it's one of the poorest nations in the world. Its main exports cashews now clearly cocaine is not coca is not grown there it's transported (coughs) through there so then goes up through africa into europe and then the uk so if someone listening to this or watching this is using cocaine and i think that people should have the right to do so which we can get to there's a decent chance it may have gone through guinea bissau in the last three six twelve months this is the thing often when people talk about the um uh the the moral issues surrounding drug consumption Mm not just at the point of sale in the global north and that, you know, the young person you're buying it from is going to be locked up and you'll be fine, etc. Yes. Generally, if you're, if you're wealthy, probably fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, or white, especially. Yeah. Um, and not just at the point of production. Again, subject to huge um, levels of inequality, mm. uh, absence of rule of law, etc., etc. Yep. But even just the logistics, the, the transit points, like it's Guinea-Bissau. It's unbelievable. It's a really, there's a huge over, social overhead in multiple countries if you're consuming cocaine in, in the global I mean, right cocaine now. particularly, and again, I preface my comment by saying I think these drugs should be legalized and regulated, but the truth is that the amount of people to get it from a farmer in Colombia or Peru to someone in, say, London or Manchester or wherever is unbelievable. And the vast majority of those people are getting paid little to nothing. It is a, I would call it, it's a, it's a quasi-slave trade of sorts of to get a drug which has never been in more demand. And the UK has the highest rates of cocaine use in Europe, highest rates of is cocaine that true? abuse. Is demand still going up for it? It is. I mean, the figures in the UK are insane. It is massive and growing. Apparently, in London, it's quicker to get a pizza, to li- sorry, cocaine than pizza. It costs roughly 30, 40 quid in the UK, allegedly, in London, I should say. Um, there is demand, and it's not just the uh, stereotype of, you know, the rich bankers. Yeah, they're using it, but it's become very middle class and lower middle class as well. 
because it's become cheaper. Purity's increased. So that, Purity's increased. It's increased it? actually, but of course the problem with that is that sometimes people don't know what they're taking because it's not regulated or checked. They are often mixing it with drinking too many beers, and that can be a problem if people have health issues. So hospitalizations in the UK is the highest in Europe. Uh, often it's being mixed with fentanyl, which clearly is potentially deadly. And fentanyl being fentanyl being a opioid that is um, can have medical use, but a lot of the people who are now dying in the US people talk about the opioid crisis and it is the worst drug crisis in US history. A lot of people these days actually are dying more from fentanyl than actually taking oxycodone, for example, one of the more infamous opioids because people often get addicted to opioids they can't get anymore and they want something stronger and better than fentanyl they can get via the dark web from China, increasingly narcos in Mexico see a new market and they are producing fentanyl in like El Chapo, the infamous drug dealer who's now in US prison. His Sinaloa cartel, which has not suffered at all since he's been in prison in the US, has now realised that they can make amazing amounts of money because of US demand by producing fentanyl in Mexico. So they've so, got the pharmaceuticals industry effectively. Indeed. In other words, this idea somehow until you legalise and regulate everything. Now you could argue, as some do, even if you did, did all that next week, the cartels would find some other way to make money. And yes, kidnapping, which they do already, and other things, that's true. But with marijuana legalization in the US, or some of the US, that ability to make money from that drug in many Mexican cartels has gone down because there's now a legal supply, right? Or it's legally grown in the US, parts of the US. Despite the fact that in some US states now the dark, the um, black market is still actually thriving. But that's a separate issue. But nonetheless, in general... There's sort of a crazy sense that the rate of use and abuse of cocaine here, here being the UK, is really, and I say that with concern, not because I said I think people shouldn't take it if they want. And I get frustrated here when you have people like your Sadiq Khan's you know, London mayor, um, head of the Met police last year saying, you know, people who use cocaine don't care about people who are providing it to them. And that's true to an extent. In other words, there's a supply chain that's pretty ugly and someone who may be providing it to you as a dealer or someone further down the line might be affected. The problem is there's no however after that. It's like saying, okay, that's true, but you're not advocating a different policy. That's basically a version of just say no. That's a version of saying kids don't take cocaine because someone might be affected. What I'm saying with evidence as opposed to political bullshit rhetoric, is saying if you want to change this and actually help people who are producing a drug that I think should be legal and regulated and not as available and not advertised and much more difficult. In other words, the aim of legalisation is to make these drugs boring, <coughs> which we'll get to. But anyway, everyone's using cocaine in the UK. Who knew? Well, I remember before the crisis, I mean, before 2007 eight, it was ubiquitous because obviously cocaine. there wasn't just huge amounts of supply, but people were very... Huge amounts of credit, high rates of employment. It's even much, way higher wow. now. I'm, maybe I'm just, I'm probably in different circles these <laughs> days. Uh, before we go any further, you're watching Tisky Sour on Avara Media. My name's Aaron Mastani. Tonight's guest is Anthony Lowenstein, the author of this fabulous book, Pills, Powder and Smoke, Inside the Bloody War on Drugs. Great book, but even, even a more important topic, I guess, that's the point, is the topic is a huge one. Um, if you like what you're watching, why not click the subscribe button how many people we got watching right now? 468. We're going every night. So the sort of the audience is not because normally we wouldn't broadcast a show on a on a Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, and a Monday. However, click the subscribe button. It really helps. We've only got 122 thumbs at the moment. Help us. <laughs> click the thumb up. <laughs> a thumbs are like manners. Doesn't cost you a penny. And also go on the hashtag. Share the show. It's in the description. More and more people need to be informed about the failed war on drugs. I think it's fair to say. Many of our viewers probably already agree on that. And I hope Anthony is enlightening you further. Right, so Guinea-Bissau, mm. it was kind of like a, a revelation to me because I thought failed state, a failed state is a perfect place by which you can, you'd either want to base an operation there or use it as a transit totally. route because you don't want police, you want high rates of corruption, yes. weak state institutions. Yep. This is where drugs then go. So cocaine routes to Europe from South America go from the Caribbean to through Guinea-Bissau, West Africa. <clears throat> and then it becomes like the, the Ouroboros, the, the self-eating snake, you know, this weak slash almost failed state, mm -hmm. greater levels of narcotics, greater levels of corruption, weaker institutions, and it goes round and round and round. It becomes a kind of a self-reinforcing dynamic 
obviously not the only country. Is that is that a fair assessment about the relationship between the global drugs trade and the very weakest countries when it comes to state institutions? Yes, in a word. I mean, cartels are looking for vulnerable states to ply their trade. And the drug trade is the second biggest illegal trade in the world. It's worth over half a trillion dollars a year and wow. growing. What's Massive. The, what's the biggest? Uh, pirated goods, right. would you believe? But drugs are pretty high. And for all the obvious reasons, I mean, I think, and I discuss this in the book, that people are taking drugs for a million reasons. Clearly, the social, psychological reasons people are consuming more drugs is a relevant one. I don't go into massive amounts of detail. It's obviously, I think, is connected in sometimes to people's um, psychological state, people taking drugs for so-called good reasons, having a fun night out, to so-called bad reasons maybe, which could be, you know, suppressing bad thoughts, relationship breakup, whatever it may be. But the drug trade is, on one level, unbelievably successful, Cartels will find a new route if one gets shut down. If there's some law enforcement activity in one West African country for a while, another one will be found next door. Many of those West African states are equally <coughs> vulnerable. They're poor. And Honduras is similar. I mean, Honduras obviously is a key US uh, client state. It's a narco president. His brother was recently found guilty in a US um, court for trying to import cocaine what's the, to the What's US. the president's name? Uh, Juan Hernan uh, Hernandez. In Honduras. And the previous one was, I've got Duterte in my head now because of the Philippines, but the one who was removed by the US in 2009? Uh, his name was, having a really disturbing mental blank. Um, help me out here, you got the book in no, front no, of No, no, it's a really, um, it's so similar to Duterte, that's the point. But what, you, what you talk about in the book, it's quite interesting, is that um, uh, Hillary Clinton openly talks about removing him in a US-backed coup in 2009 in her book. But it's in, in the, one version. It's of, in the hardback. It's and then so there, weird, right? And then there was like some blow black back and doesn't yeah. the, the paperback. It's so weird. Basically in her in her um, self-serving, I guess it was a memoir, I'll call it whatever you want. She talks about how there was a coup in 2009. The US was involved in trying to bring stability back and they were very happy. Zelaya. Zelaya was the um, former president. Just remember that. Um, we're happy to basically usher him out. And I mean, let's face it, he was basically taken out of his um, bedroom in pyjamas and flown out of the country. In the paperback edition of Hillary's book, disappeared. And it's weird in a way because when it comes to US elections, let's face it, foreign policy rarely is really an issue, right? I mean, yes, the Iraq war, Trump very cleverly used the Iraq war to support, even though he actually did support the Iraq war, but he framed it as being against it. <coughs> but in general, foreign policy doesn't play much of a feature, sadly, in, in US politics but hillary was i guess or her people i guess it's probably more her people were embarrassed or ashamed or somehow thought this looked bad that she was had basically come out and said, you know yeah you know, yeah we backed the coup um it's not a great look i wouldn't think i mean i'm not saying it affected her chance in winning in 2016 but well, you see why the left wouldn't be enthused about her <clears throat> no Sorry. um and with honduras it's really you know the way again you steep it in the sort of broader history of the 20th century um the letter from John Ewing, a U.S. minister in Tegucigalpa, which is the capital of Honduras, mm. sent a letter in 1914. This is 100 years ago. Yeah. To the U.S. State Department, explained the power of what was the United Fruit Company to, quote, enter actively into the internal policies of many nations. So you have U.S. imperialism in the Western Hemisphere in particular when we're talking about, you know, the war on drugs. Yeah. Already you have these weak state institutions. And then as we've said, the war on drugs itself exacerbates this and mm. increases in uh, criminality and, and weakens those very same institutions. Uh, and there isn't really a, the, the American left, and I don't mean the radical left, I mean the sort of center, the center ground of the Democratic Party, they don't really have a holistic understanding of this, do they? Or, am, being, I, or am I being unfair? They've been complicit in it. I mean, one of the controversies as listeners and viewers will be aware is the record of Joe Biden. Democrat. I mean, I call him more of a sort of conservative Republican, but nonetheless, a Democrat could be the candidate. God help us this year, maybe, hopefully not. His record on supporting war on drug policies, mass incarceration is legendary. It's known, it's clear, it's on the record. There's no doubt about that. Bill Clinton is as well, Hillary Clinton too. Virtually all the Democratic establishment for years have supported hard line on drugs. Republicans have too, of course, but yes, the so-called mainstream democratic left, I wouldn't even call it left, but mainstream democratic party, <coughs> with some exceptions, has generally supported the drug war. What would Warren say 
if, if, if you said to Liz Warren, you have her for five minutes in front of an Avara media camera, yeah. get Bernie, he'll probably say the right thing. But Liz Warren or Pete Buttigieg. Um, well, Pete's policies on this... But how would it intersect with their foreign policy sort of analysis of Latin America? Problematically. Right. Because I don't think... My sense is with Warren and Buttigieg is that their view is they're happy to basically keep US empire churning along quite nicely. Thank you very much. There's a critique of sorts. It's a very mild critique. It's basically Trump is doing it badly. Um, that's not really a critique. Uh, and in some ways, let's be frank, after four years of Trump, he's killed far, far less people globally than Obama did or Bush. There's no doubt about that. Well, that's that. a take. That's it's a hot true. take. No, no, it's categorically true. But yeah, but I, I, it's a take. I mean, people don't say, people don't say it. <laughs> because most of the so-called mainstream left have rose-coloured fucking glasses about Barack Obama, and it's really, really disturbing. Did he, did, did he deport more people than he, Trump has at, yes. in his first three years? I mean, Trump might get worse, right? Gloves he might, might come get off probably second, a hell of a lot worse. Second term. Yeah, Trump second term like, is not going to be pretty if it happens. God help us. But he, I think, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think I have them in the book. But the numbers of... Um, uh, you know, that Obama deported, well, you know, he was coined, you know, the deporter in chief. Yeah. Millions. Yeah. Um, and Obama's foreign policy on a lot of issues, Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, was bloody beyond belief. I mean, so is Trump's. Let's be of it clear. But Trump's, in some weird way, has, it oscillates between mad neocon and strange isolationist. And the people around him are more neocons and isolationists, yeah. to be sure. But, Again, you know, let's not, you know, it's sort of a bit on one level grim talking about, you know, the death toll. But, yes, yeah, so far, Obama's been far more bloody than Trump, by far. So, but, anyway, but in terms of, yes, Warren, briefly, Warren, Warren has been critical of the drug war. She has talked about reparations. Because they want to legalise drugs. They, they don't want to... Cannabis. Sp- yeah. They, Cannabis. Well, can- marijuana, yeah, yes. let's say. Um, but Buttigieg actually has decriminalize- talked about... Decrim- he's talked about decriminalising all drugs which is actually a, a positive step, uh, which Bernie is not suggesting, actually. Um, I think he could be sort of convinced, and Warren maybe. I mean, decriminalisation is essentially what Portugal did in 2001. Very briefly, they had the worst HIV rates in Europe. There was a desperate situation. Uh, they needed to find some solution. They chose what was then a pretty radical step. All drugs decriminalised. 20 years roughly on, the results are really clear, Aaron. Essentially, it shows that use and abuse has dived. People still will abuse drugs, yes, and get in trouble for them. But the effect of spending way less money on law enforcement is you spend more money on education and health and people get into trouble from drugs. Is this a, com- <clears throat> is this a completely uncontentious point? Does everybody, does everybody well, basically fact, yes, agree that Portugal's yes. worked? I think if anyone, I mean, I can't say there's some crazy link on Google that says otherwise, but yeah, the evidence is pretty clear on that. Very clear, in fact. Um, uncontested. I mean, well, I'd say uncontested apart from lunatics, but yes, uncontested. Um, now, Portugal is not the US. Obviously, Portugal is a tiny country. The US, I mean, you know, one, one, one can't say what works in one country automatically works elsewhere. But the Portuguese model works. We've now had 20 years of evidence. It's clear. It works. And no other country in the world so far has decriminalized all drugs. Now, Pete Buttigieg on foreign policy would no doubt continue a very brutal foreign policy of, as the US presidents always do, like to show you're tough, you've got to kill people. This, this is how it works. This is, this is the role of, of US empire. You've got to kill people to be tough. And I'm sure Bernie would too. I mean, Bernie's record on a lot of issues is fantastic. I think he's probably the best of a not a great, option, a great, great collection. But he's had problems over the years. His record needs to be addressed. He's supported at various times um, the bombing of Iraq. He supported um, sanctions on Iraq at various times. He supported bombing of Iraq at various years ago. This is before 2003. There's a a reckoning of sorts that needs to happen with his record. I mean, he's clearly by far, he has an understanding what US empire is and wants to at least curtail it. But to be honest, in 2007, 8, if you heard what Obama, for example, was saying about Palestine, it was Mm. actually pretty good. It was all right. He he had a critique of it. I think, think, we'll move on quickly, but I think think most of our audience, I mean, I'm perfectly aware that America is a global hegemon. Whoever's elected president, you know, could be the most radical left-wing person imaginable. Ultimately, you're not going to be able to curtail foreign policy significantly. You could, you could a little bit. At least but, overnight. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think with domestic policy, you know, over two terms, if you have Congress, it's plausible you, 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 could. Could, do what, you could do what FDR did in the 30s. But it's ironic, in fact, that the president has far more leeway to do stuff foreign policy-wise than domestically. It's the same in this country, though, right? What, what really upset people about Jeremy Corbyn 
wasn't actually, you know, ending austerity and scrapping mm. tuition fees. That was not that was not the major thing that got, you know, senior military people briefing the Sunday Times that they would undermine him if he was the prime minister. It was the foreign policy stuff. Um, Which is incredibly sensible policy, by the way. Yeah. Corbyn. I mean, and not radical. I mean, radical in the context of, of here. And I do hope whoever leads Labour next does not drop all that. But I fear that they might. But let's see. Well, foreign, the foreign policies, <laughs> this is, we're going back to you know, your, your old stomping ground. But yeah, I mean, the thing with British, Br- British military intervention over, overseas is that most of it's special forces now. Most of it's drone strikes. You know, we're not going to hear about this stuff for another 30 years yeah. in Chad or, you know, people have no idea what's going on uh, because it's just not being signed off by, by, by government. Um, having spoken about Portugal, how it was effective in curtailing uh, transmission rates of HIV, et cetera, let's go the other side. There's another solution, at least if you're Duterte in the yeah. Philippines. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happened in regards to the war on drugs in the Philippines since, what, 2016? 16. So Duterte won election in 2016. Uh, very popular man. He used to be mayor of an uh, area called Davao in the Philippines and unleashed there when he was there years before being leader of the Philippines. A brutal, bloody war by vigilantes and gangs to kill drug users and people he didn't like, usually the poor. It's always a war on the poor, always. Since 2016, I spent time in the Philippines not that long ago, no one knows how many people have been killed. Probably at least 30,000, mostly all poor. These are people who live in slums in Manila who are usually taking... 30,000? At least. And that's state-backed. That is state-backed by the police or... or, That's either police or vigilantes backed by police, supported by police. These are figures that have been quoted by various human rights groups. I mean, no one knows the exact figure. These people mostly there are taking a drug called Shabu, which is like a methamphetamine. And uh, for people who may be wondering, you know, when you go to places like that and you see the communities where they're living who are mostly being killed, these are people who are the poorest of the poor... They're often doing hard manual labor, sex work. Not all, of course, but many. And taking a drug like that makes absolute perfect sense to get through the day. Like when I was in Nigeria last year, I did a film for Al Jazeera about this tramadol I mentioned before. People taking tramadol just to get through the day. I mean, the idea that one is going to kill people simply for... Your country's economic situation is incredibly grim, so we're going to punish people for taking drugs to deal with getting through the day. I mean, that's basically what the Philippines has done. It remains incredibly popular. These are communities that are being devastated by um, vigilante violence. I spent time with some of the key um, government supporters of this, not Duterte, but people just below him. And one guy, the head of the drug unit, said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, our aim by the end of Duterte's first term is to make sure that no one's taking drugs in the Philippines. Straight face. And so when is that? When's the... Uh, 2022. So he's got two years. I mean, sure. So what does that mean? You, what, you kill them all? You just kill, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, I asked, I mean, good question. Yeah. I mean, it, I put that in the book. I mean, uh, what does it mean? It means killing a hell of a lot more people. It means, but I think also the, the Duterte policy is one of a few things. One, which is very disturbing. The killing is clearly devastating, but it's, he had, there was midterms last year. His support went up. Now, obviously, there are some people who oppose what he's doing, to be sure. But he's very popular. Um, and I think it's also... A, 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 the delusion is it is a... Um, you're supposed to be convinced that taking drugs is so awful and bad that you may risk being killed and therefore you shouldn't do it. In other words, it's sort of a... It's, you'll be punished by death. And I spent time at one night... There's this weird thing there called like... Night, journalists and photographers kind of wait around for the call that someone's been murdered. And they're called night crawlers. In the Philippines. In the Philippines. And this is a weird... So I... And I felt... I write this in the book. I mean, there's a sense of feeling voyeuristic. And I think a lot of journalists are awful vultures. In those cases, I think they're documenting the killings. I think it's important to document it. But... So one night I was there with my fixer, a local journalist with whom I worked. Got a call, raced in the car to this area in Manila. And there we had seen a man who'd been killed about 20 minutes before. I didn't touch his body, but his body obviously was still warm. There was blood pouring out of his head. There were kids taking photos with their parents' phones. He ran a scrap metal shop. And 
Now, you're going to probably ask me, who was this guy? What did he do? He Was he a drug user? Possibly. Um, who killed him? God knows. And I followed up on this with over time to see what was the investigation. The police arrived in time and took the body away and this guy's possessions, this guy's, I don't know if it was his mother or some loved one arrived and was, you know, hitting herself. She was so emotional and so upset with what I guess her son had, had been killed. There was never going to be an investigation into this guy. What happened? Who killed him? Why he was killed? And this is the case with countless people. These people are, you know, unpeople. They're faceless. They, I mean, you know, he had a name and I named him in the book, but there's no accountability. I mean, you know, literally, I mean, who the, who the hell knows what he was doing, mm. what he was involved in? But, and, and, you know, that's replicated over and over again. And you talk about, um, in terms of making the Philippines the world's first drug-free country by 2021, mm. 2022, um, the proposal in 2019, which made children as young as nine criminally responsible for their actions uh, and the proposal of drugs testing all children from grade four. Well, you can, they so start all, young, all, don't they? All kids would be drugs tested. My understanding is some of that actually has gone through and some of it has not. There was pushback to that, but there's certainly a, a, an aim to do that. I mean, again, it's about you, 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 I guess, convince through the parents that kids should be, I mean, it literally is the, the most extreme version of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No. It really is a sense that kids need to be propagandized early, make sure they don't use drugs. I mean, my view, of course, you should be educating kids from a young age the opposite, not to go and take cocaine when you're 10, but to understand that, you know, the nuance of drugs. Not I mean, I'd rather 12. kids at 10 try something, well, not drugs at 10, but I'd rather kids at 16 try something in a safe environment than be, Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, criminally responsible at the age of nine. It's kind of, it goes that's insane. That. It's insane. But it has a lot of support. I mean, not everything that Duterte has done, including that, but there is huge amounts of support. And what was really disturbing in some ways was speaking to people whose family members had been killed. They weren't all supporting him, but many of them thought he was amazing, that he was almost creating an ideal society. In other words, wouldn't it be great if everyone stopped so the thinking went, that all drug taking would stop or at least be massively reduced. We'd be a much more harmonious society. And of course, Philippines, as I say in the book, was a US client state for years and the US relationship now is murkier. They certainly still support each other. Trump has come out very publicly and said to Turtay's war is amazing because in some ways I think Trump wishes he could do... Do you think Trump would like to do that? Do you think yes. Trump would like... Well, he's also praised the Chinese... Um, drug policy too, which includes executing people as well. Yes, thirty thousand people. Do you think Trump? So Trump's held that up as exemplary way of dealing with. Well, he's regularly said, oh, both both on secret recordings and publicly, that he thinks that Turte is doing a wonderful slap up job. People, can, find, people can Google that easily. Turte is what seventy one, even though he identifies Apparently quite as sick, a, but a, yes, identifies as a socialist. Yes, um, yeah, they're socialists and they're socialists. Yeah, of course. Uh, and he is not the best kind of socialist. Yeah, for, okay. Yeah. Forget, I'll park, <laughs> park the socialist word, but um, yeah, he kind of fits quite nicely into that kind of Narendra Modi, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro. A very successful populist. Very successful. Uh, and obviously, and there's no doubt, briefly, the context is that the, um, a lot of people in the Philippines felt ostracized from years and years of neoliberal policies. Duterte comes in and says, I'm going to remake your society and I'm going to fight a very brutal, dr brutal drug war. It wasn't even a secret before. I mean, no one expected maybe he was going to kill that many people, but it wasn't a secret. Um, and... I mean, his allegations, his own family is involved in drug trafficking as well. He could be a drug addict as, too. I mean, it's a Philippines is a really weird, fascinating place. It's a huge but country as well. It's like huge, like 150 million people. Massive. Or? I don't know. I can't, yes, a lot. A lot of people. It's off the radar for most Europeans. Um, well, they made them go there on holiday, by the way. Huh? Many of them go there on holiday. I've never been. You've been, you've no, been well, well, I was there for work. I wasn't, been I wasn't relaxing for too leisure? much there. The only time I've I ever haven't. seen it is... Um, it's like island, it's like so tropical islands. Manila's Manila. the capital, right? It is, but there's like tropical. I saw a documentary islands. about like slums in Manila, and it'd be interesting to see how that intersects with the kind of some of the drug stuff. Well, that's where all the killings happen. Yeah, and the killing fields are mostly in Manila, right? And you literally go to posh suburbs, and then half an hour away, you have vigilante police going around assassinating people. I mean, this is, and I think what's scary is that for a lot of countries in Asia and elsewhere for that matter, there's either a so-called Duterte model, which is either as brutal or not as brutal, saying this legalization, liberalization bollocks in the US and elsewhere, that's not the way we deal with drugs. We have to be harsh and remain harsh. We can kill our way out, out of the problem. Mm. 
And ironically, the US, in fact, which for decades was the key purveyor of harsh drug law policies, is no longer seen as that player. Sure, Trump is very harsh, but countries like China, Iran, Egypt, Russia, Philippines, they're in some ways, it's almost like the world can be in two. I mean, the US is kind of torn. On the one hand, yes, they think that well, some, the cannabis should be legalised. And I do think that the US will legalise cannabis in the next, well, obviously, if Bernie wins or Elizabeth Warren in the next year or two, but soon. And I think Britain actually will as well, to be honest. We're not, I think we're moving towards that. More than a second. Here's the quote <clears throat> from American historian and drug war expert Alfred McCoy, uh, who talks about an overlooked aspect of global populism being, quote, the role of performative violence in projecting domestic strength and a complementary need for diplomatic success to show international influence. So, I mean, with regards to Duterte, quite clear. This, and all the, and all the people that you mentioned. Violence, yeah. Bolsonaro, Trump... Um Others, absolutely. Modi. I mean, Brazil, Brazil and it's, in terms of, because Brazil has huge problems in terms of domestic violence uh, and unrest. Um, absolutely. And that intersects and drug mass- war violence massively with the drugs wars, right? Indeed. It's a, hu- it's a huge, I mean, Bolsonaro, I mean, this was happening before he became leader, of course, but Brazil has huge problems with uh, not just drug use and abuse, but also drug violence. I mean, people can look online if they haven't seen this. Literally, there are police helicopters above favelas in Rio and elsewhere just shooting people. Oh, no, I've seen the most horrific I mean, it's stuff. insane. Yeah. I and mean, these are people aren't all to do with drugs. But it is, it is. I mean, Bolsonaro has taken off the leash. And the violence was awful before he came into power. And the drug war is key to that because you, again, create a fiction that you, you can move towards a society which is, if not drug-free, certainly less drug-taking. And is always the case. They're not going after the people using coke. Rich people, I mean. The elites. Like in the UK or the US. Yes, now and then a rich... Um, coke user or dealer will be arrested that happens but mostly this is and this is what I try to say in the book like with so many issues frankly class 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 it is about class the drug war is about class who we're punishing is about class black or white I mean depends where we are but it's about class the drug war is about enforcing and reinforcing certain kind of class norms obviously Britain is obsessed with class for often bad reasons for good reason on the other hand because we if we talk about what that actually means practically and I spent time going around the UK to see what 10 years of austerity from the Tories has done not that Labor was fantastic when they were in power in the past either which I discussed too but 10 years of Tory rule has left this country in some parts with generations who are have no drug support, no drug, you know, if they're addicted, um, New, I spent time in Newcastle, which on the face of it's a very beautiful city in the north, but there are literally generations of kids and older people, black and white, I was spending more time with whites, but there are others too, who have no support if they get into trouble, if they need drug uh, support, and that's a problem. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. I'm holding We're going to talk about solutions towards holding the end. Um, quickly back to America. Eight states have legalized marijuana. 11 now. Uh, if, I say, if I say eight, it's probably eight changed since. Uh, yeah, oh, no, wow. it's, it's moved. It wasn't wrong. It's just improved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alaska, Colorado, California, Washington, D.C. So big, prominent states. And uh, California among, being um, the biggest, absolutely. Yeah, amongst those, amongst mm. those eight. Um, how did that happen culturally? Because we talked at the top of the show about how you wouldn't have seen this coming down the road 15 years ago. How did that happen? Is it an outgrowth of demographics, campaigning? What changed? You know, briefly, it's interesting. There was never millions of people marching down the street saying, you know, free pot. It wasn't happening. I compare it, I think, to cultural shifts. I think medical marijuana played a big part. A lot of people were using it anyway. So it's an acceptance that this drug that had been demonised for decades wasn't that bad. I mean, not that... I say in the book, there are issues with excessive use of cannabis and I don't for a second say there aren't. And that's been one of the problems with, with legalisation actually in the US, that too often advocates have sort of ignored that. If you smoke a joint, fine. And again, I think that should be legal, but excessive use is a problem, like with any substance. And I think too often the danger is if one doesn't acknowledge that, then you are endangering the possibility of legalising, regulating other drugs anyway. But... I think there was cultural shifts. There was a, there was public campaigns to be sure, drug reform groups, etc. There was a shift, I think, also with someone like Obama, who came out and whereas in previous political leaders would have said, "I didn't inhale," yeah. like Bill Clinton and others, 
Obama said, both in his book and also on the campaign trail 2007-8, he used coke, he used cannabis. I mean, I think he said, I don't do it anymore, but I didn't, you know, it was part of my growing up and it was normal in Hawaii and elsewhere. And that sort of almost gives a cultural acceptance. I think popular culture with film and TV, I mean, drug use in music videos uh, is ubiquitous. And I think a lot of people also, like I see in the UK, are simply using these drugs, particularly cannabis and ecstasy and cocaine, and they see that in 90 to 95% of cases, people are not having problems with it. They're not getting into trouble. They're not dying. They're not getting addicted. They're doing it for a thousand reasons. They enjoy it, whatever. It's a tiny percentage of people who have problems with drugs. So that, I think, has been a cultural shift. Do you think also the fact that it's a federal state and you can have these local referenda, et cetera, yes. do you think that's just one of the reasons why... It, I mean, if it does happen in Britain, I think it probably will happen in Scotland or Wales first, or it would be a major city, wouldn't it? Is that Potentially, a major factor, do you think? I think it's partly that, and I think exactly that there was a sense probably in the US that changing it federally was a long game and that you could start, advocates were saying, well, as you said, let's start doing it state by state. And there were a lot of advocates I met who feature in the book who tried a number of times. They went to the ballot, the ballot failed. And some ballots still do fail. And there's certainly, a, there is an interesting backlash. And when these ballots are put in front of people, um, US elections, often the groups that are funding the anti-cannabis legalization campaigns the most are alcohol companies and police organisations because they... Well, the alcohol companies, of course, fear that their um, consumption rates will go down because people will start smoking pot instead of drinking. And police unions and police groups and others who just have a quite a hard line. I mean, I'm general... I don't know any police who now change that view, but there are some hard line mm. police groups. So I think it's been a cultural shift. And now... And I, I compare it in the book to um, gay marriage where the different issues entirely... But 10 years ago in the US and elsewhere, the numbers, 15 years ago, the numbers were the opposite of what they became. That it, it, More and more people saw their friends gay, whoever it may be, it was normal, it wasn't a problem, it wasn't, you know, they weren't, you know, religion became less important and this became a normal part of life. If you're gay, you're gay. If you're not, you're not, whatever. And cannabis, I think, was very similar, that it was not, it had been demonised for so long in a ridiculously absurd way that I think people in the end realised it was a drug that could be used and it was being used and it was so easy to obtain. And that was also a factor. So we're going to take questions in five minutes. I think we're going to go 10 minutes over tonight, if that's all right. Because we're going to talk about solutions for 10 minutes, yeah. decriminalisation, etc. moving forward. And then we're going to go to questions from you guys. If you want to ask a question, get in the comments. Cheers. Um, use the rocket emoji. Also use the hashtag on Twitter. Hashtag Tisky Sour. Um, we'll be trailing questions more or less now. Uh, kind words from Joseph Goddard on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Tisky Sour on fire this week. Tonight, the war on drugs. Navarro Media forging new grounds for representing the left. Very kind. Probably not true, but still. <laughs> Thank you, well, sir. <laughs> very welcome. Um, that's very, very kind of you to say. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll be taking questions very shortly. At the moment, we've got, what, 620 people watching? Uh, only 316 thumbs. You want, if, how, many, how many do you want more? You want it, more? I want a couple of hundred more. If everybody watching this just hit the thumb button, right? <laughs> right I now. would really appreciate it. Right now. <laughs> right now. Right now. And also, once you've done that, uh, go to subscribe. Uh, and even more than that, Fox, the producer, said I shouldn't do multiple asks. I'm going to do it. Go to support.navaramedia.com. We want to do more content like this. We did a great show as well last night about mercenaries with Phil Miller, friend of uh, yes. Anthony. Great journalist. And YouTube tends to demonetize this stuff if it's about violence or war. Uh, and so if you want to see more of this stuff, go to support.navaramedia.com. Help us build a new media for different politics. Uh, because for these things to break through, for policy change to happen, clearly we need more platforms where we can discuss these things in an informed, civilized manner. Having said that, and I hope we're doing that, you've certainly informed me a lot tonight and with the book. Thank you. Um, so you think all, all drugs should be decriminalized and legalized no legalized and regulated so i mean decriminalized is the first step these are two separate things perhaps we should talk about but yeah you, you think they should be just openly embraced and regulated yeah i think briefly what legalization and regulation does not mean is that you go into a you know boots and you know buy your, your heroin it doesn't mean that it means certainly in the model i would like and a lot of advocates that are in the book and prominent advocates would say for example no advertising anywhere for anything um you would depending on the seriousness of the drug where it's available. You, as I said, heroin would be potentially available on prescription. 
um, cocaine would be also maybe available through a pharmacy. There'd be a question of, because you know what's in the drug, if it's regulated, you know the strength of it. There may be, as some advocates talk about, um, coca-infused drinks. It's not that, that wouldn't get you so high that you couldn't function, but it would be, you know, which already exists of sorts, like, it's like called snus. It's like something, it's like chewing tobacco mm. with coca, which already exists in parts of Colombia. Um, I guess it's like cat, you know, the drug that's often, or the plant's mm-hmm. often chewed by people in Yemen. Um, what did you think of that? Cats. Of? I've yeah. never actually used it. I had it once and I, I was like, this doesn't... Does, does nothing for you. Yeah, but I, mean, I, 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 yeah, I never actually used it. I mean, I, I'd be curious to use it. I, I got it from it. a taxi rank in Camden in 2003. It's illegal here now, off isn't a bu- it? Off a bunch of East Africans. At the time... Um, well, it's not then, but at now At the time it, it was like, a, well, it was a bit like magic mushrooms at the time. If they were wet and fresh, there was kind of some legal loophole. Yes, I think the Tories now. I mean, I'm sure it's still used, and but I mean, I think as far as I understand, a few years ago, I think they made it, which is absurd, kind of illegal. I mean, anyway, so yeah, but legalized and regulated system would be a such a fundamentally different way of society. The amount of money you spend on law enforcement would dive. The amount of money you spend on health and education would soar. It's not when I say it, an advocate say imagining a sort of you know, utopia. No one's saying that. But I think at the moment, the, the cost for, of prohibition, not just in a financial sense, but in a moral sense, is so profound. The amount of <coughs> dislocation, poverty around the world, including here. And legalization and regulation almost in time would make these drugs kind of boring. In other words, if you want as an adult to smoke a joint or maybe use cocaine, you should have, in my view, the right to do so with appropriate safeguards in place. Warning labels are key, vital. And you see that the effect of that with, say, smoking, cigarettes, that warning labels have had a massive impact on smoking coming down in popularity. And, and I said, I think cigarettes should be available, should be bloody expensive, in my view, with a warning label. And there should be, frankly, a much bigger warning label on alcohol, by the way, which does not exist. And there should be, because alcohol is, frankly, the most damaging drug. Again, I drink, I'm not saying that as a teetotaler, I drink alcohol. But I do think that the potential dangers of excessive drinking are real. I'm talking about cancer mm-hmm. and other drugs. So a legalised, regulated system is one where drugs are treated normally. They're treated as something which is a part of life. They're treated as something which has always been used in society for thousands of years in various parts around the world. And they also don't demonise the most vulnerable, who are always the ones who are most targeted. And even in the US, where in many states, as we discussed, cannabis is legal... In 2018, the FBI still um, arrested and wanted to prosecute over 600,000 people for low-level cannabis offences. So the idea somehow that that is a worthy um, use of state money is insane. To achieve what, exactly? No, I think that for most of the criminal justice system. I mean, I don't know why the... I don't know why there is not more agreement across the political spectrum for these kinds of things because they're just such bad. Public, if you speak to them, pro- a lot of public politicians policy privately, choices. There is, including, yeah. and I spoke to some of them in the book in Labor and the Tories. I spoke to them before the last election, though, and there are people in the Labor Party and the Tories, for that matter, who are—it's a minority—who <laughs> support this. Support may not legalizing all drugs, but certainly decriminalizing all drugs, legalizing cannabis. For sure, Crispin Blunt. Uh, Tory MP, conservative guy, obviously, supports legalising all drugs and regulating them. He's one of the more prominent conservative voices. And I think if he has more influence than the Tory party, bring it on. Uh, we're going to pull up your article in The Guardian, if that's possible. Yeah. That was about uh, Britain's drug crisis and legalisation. What Labour should do. Yeah. Um, it's up there. I'll just read an excerpt from it. Britain is in the midst of a drug emergency. The country is witnessing unprecedented rates of Class A drug use. Border force officers are seizing more co- cocaine than at any time in recorded history. The problem is particularly bad in Scotland, which has the highest rate of drug deaths in the European Union. 1,187 people died in 2018 in Scotland a record number, and the figures for 2019 look set to be even higher. This catastrophe was wholly avoidable. The British government had been willing to tackle the issue with the seriousness it deserves. Instead, there's been a huge reduction in services for those affected by drug addiction, as you alluded to with Newcastle. Mm. The sad reality is that the young people being lost to drugs are mostly poor and voiceless, so politicians pay little attention to them. You go on to say, in the last 20 years, Labour has often pushed draconian policies. But last year, the party came out in favour of launching a royal commission to review the legalisation of drugs. Once a new leader is in in place, it needs to go further. 
advocating the removal of criminal charges for personal possession of illicit substances, pushing to legalize and regulate all drugs and funding research into the viable use of psychedelic drugs such as MDMA, psilocybin and ketamine in the treatment of mental health problems. Until adopsy stances, it can't be considered a truly progressive party. Now, we're going to go to questions very, very mm. shortly. But what I find unbelievably surreal almost, I'll be listening to like Silicon Valley podcasts and they'll be talking about microdosing yeah. ketamine. And then there'll be some kid on the street, working class kid, both parents on, you know, minimum wage or whatever, and they're arrested for a tenth of cannabis. Yep. And it's just like, okay, class. This, this, before, class, this class, billionaire class. is talking about psilocybin or ketamine or MDMA yeah. and then this... In a weird kind of way, you know, Aaron, the, the psychedelics actually are almost like the, um, the gateway drug. And what I mean by that is that increasingly, it's more in the US, but here too, there are serious, and um, people can Google this easily, serious scientific studies that show that for a lot of people who are given in controlled environments by therapists, ecstasy, MDMA, um, uh, ketamine or um, LSD and magic mushrooms, that it can profoundly help mental health. It can help people with PTSD. It can help people end of life, about to die from cancer, get off cigarettes. It doesn't help everybody. But in other words, the, the gateway drug, what I mean by that is that in the US, and Trump has not tried to stop this, thankfully, it's conceivable within less than five years, you will go to a doctor and say, I'm depressed, I have PTSD. And rather than being given antidepressant, which does help some people, but often doesn't, you are given a session, five sessions, ten sessions with a therapist in controlled environments taking some of these psychedelic drugs. That's done legally. At the moment, it's happening illegally in some parts of the world, including It's done a little yet. bit with uh, PTSD in the United States with MDMA. It's been there trialed. There are many trials, and that's why the FDA in the US is moving towards making it legal within potentially a handful of years. As again, not just using it at a, at a party, which is something I think should be legal too, but I'm talking about for therapy, for mental health issues. And, of course, what I say in the book, though, the caveat to all this is, although that's incredibly wonderful and important and the science shows that these drugs can profoundly help people, again, it's about access and class. We don't want a situation where just the wealthy can go to a therapist and have their wonderful ecstasy sessions for two months and feel better. That's great for them, but the vast majority of people who can't afford that, unless it's available in the UK, the NHS or other um, public health benefits then that's a problem and i think those sort of policies i mean to me a, a labor party that's interested in engaging in this issue i know that labor here is not going to legalize all drugs uh, in their policy next week i get that i suggested it because i thought why not mention it but yep. i do think that the labor drug policy and i talk about this in the book and in my guardian piece um particularly during the era of blair and brown ed miliband was pretty draconian and actually was often trying to one up the Tories. Appalling. I mean, well, particularly Blair. I mean, if you look at some of the Home Secretaries, the Home Secretaries of the new Labour years, David Blunkett, John Reid, Charles Clark, horrible people, like very conservative right-wing people. I can't imagine a, home, uh, a, home, a Tory Home Secretary being any different, uh, fundamentally. Well, Theresa May certainly wasn't. <laughs> you know what? I would actually say on, on, a, on rhetoric... No different. People mm. look at Theresa May as Home Secretary as being this appalling human being, and she was, but, you know, compared to John Reid, hmm, you know, yeah. actually, because I think the, you have a prime minister, you have permission to talk about things in a far more left-wing way. Yeah. Given that, and given how right-wing they were, I think that they're very bad people. Well, it was, it was really a shame, and obviously Corbyn lost the election, so it's spilt milk now, but it did, it was a shame to me that during, not even just the election, but before that, Labour didn't make drugs issue more of an issue I but mean, you know, and Corbyn actually has often sent mixed messages and Diane yeah, Abbott had in yeah, the past yeah. about this I mean I'll answer that quickly and then we'll go to these questions mm. um, uh, like so much with the left uh, and what happened with Corbyn and obviously it failed at the end of last year um, I view you know the left's been on the up since the global financial crisis particularly mm. since 2015 let's say yeah and I look at the Corbyn project as kind of like especially after 2017 you know Napoleon and we were talking about this last night Napoleon ends up in Moscow you know, he's defeated the Russians and he's got no supply lines, doesn't really know what he's going to do next, doesn't know how this has just happened. Yeah. This was basically Labour in 2017. Was there a worked out policy for drugs decriminalisation? No. no. You know, the left hadn't had to think about these things. Not an abstraction, as a, as a, mm. as a worked out, piloted, yeah. prototyped, you know, approach, public policy approach. Nobody knew because we were just years ahead of where we need to be. And also concurrent with that, 
I think, you know, with big, deep political changes like drug decriminalization or with LGBT rights, you know, yeah. the, the culture has to precede the politics. Mm. And the left, you know, there hasn't been the time to do that because it's been reinvigorated in the last few years, but there's been this attention and obsession with electoral politics can do that. Yeah. So hopefully your article in The Guardian is catalyzed. Well, it's got a lot of interest. And it's interesting, actually, that there are certainly people in the Labor Party now who are including some MPs who support it, who I'm not saying my particular piece, or they did tweet it, but I mean that they support the idea of a, a better drug policy. Um, and look, I mean, it's not impossible that the Tories could legalise cannabis too. I mean, it's hard to see it happening next week with Boris Johnson, but there are people around him who do want to legalise cannabis can, he's come out in the past and said he supports cannabis being not treated as a criminal issue. He, he said that in the past, many years ago. Um, the problem, of course, the model that Johnson and Matoris probably would put forward, though, is more a hyper-capitalist one where the big cannabis companies are making a lot of money. And I can't imagine that the people who suffered the most from the UK drug war would get reparations and chances to get in the industry. So it wouldn't be a model I like. But I do think within five or ten years, good chance possibly, possibly, with a Tory government maybe, or even Labour, the cannabis will be legalised. I think maybe, I mean, maybe, I think maybe Scotland, or maybe, I think maybe. Wales. I think Scotland, you've got a more, you've got, again, more permission to do stuff differently up there. Yes. They've got a problem with regards to particularly heroin. Yeah. Uh, let's take questions from the yeah. audience. Uh, we're going to keep you in for another 10 minutes, if that's yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, uh, Space Communist asks, and let's answer as, as brief as possible to get through as many as possible. I will. Space Communist asks, wouldn't drug legalization and regulation give more power to private pharmaceutical companies? The risk is yes. And therefore, the model that I would advocate, and I'm not the only one doing it, like in, say, Uruguay, where it's all grown, provided, sold by the state. Private companies aren't involved at all. The US, of course, is a hyper-capitalist model. It's the opposite model. I don't have a particular problem with some companies involved personally, but overall I think the state should have the massive uh, um, dominance of a market. So no, private companies then wouldn't. But the risk, as I said, definitely is that if the Tories, say, went down the path of legalising it here and they blindly follow that what's happening in many parts of the US, big cannabis like big tobacco would take over the market and that is a problem. Next question. This is about Peter Hitchens. You know, it'd be great to have a debate between you and Peter Hitchens. I'd love it. I'm I ready. actually, f I find him quite an interesting kind of iconoclastic right wing figure, but on this, I think he's completely wrong. Um, I agree. From one, two, three, duck. What do you make of the Peter Hitchens line that quote marijuana acceptability is down to vested interests and millionaire P millionaire PR efforts? Well, look, look. Yes, there are some. Uh, cannabis entrepreneurs, including in the Republican Party in the US, who are set to make an absolute killing from legalizing cannabis, yes. But this idea somehow, I know he's argued this and I've read a lot of his work over the years, I think I mentioned in the book, that somehow cannabis is a uniquely evil drug, it causes societal carnage, and as I say in the book, and I say it again here, Excessive cannabis use can be a problem. Driving, for example, when you're incredibly high is a really bad idea, for example. No one says otherwise. I think someone like him presumes, somehow like with alcohol, that everyone who's going to start using cannabis is going to be you know, smoking 25 joints and then go driving. There's always going to be stupidity, but a legalized, regulated system actually, firstly, increasingly, will make sure that what's going into that pot, a lot of the problems with cannabis now, the synthetic stuff, is because it's illegal. In other words, the, the, the strength of these of cannabis is now, particularly synthetic cannabis, is really problematic, can be. And unless you legalise and regulate it, that kind of stuff is going to keep on polluting the market. He was talking about the Lee Rigby killers um, living on a cannabis farm. I was like, yeah, nobody is proposing this. This is not, nobody is proposing that people live in literal cannabis farms. Um, yeah, misuse of any drug is, is possible. Thank you, Pete. But yes, if he's listening, I'm sure he does all the time to your show. Uh, I'm ready. But isn't there a very real point about actually marijuana consumption at a young age is very detrimental Absolutely. to developing cognitive yes, function? it is. And again, I say this in the book and I say this very, very clearly. Anyone who advocates legalizing it needs to a, acknowledge that and put safeguards in place. Absolutely. Uh, this is from Joseph O. They ask, how, quote, new is the association of, association of anti-drug stuff with classism and social stigma? Did the Victorians also see drug use as a working class menace? Yeah, it's interesting. In the book, I talk about this too, that back in the day, um, obviously alcohol was more popular then, but not that long ago in Britain and elsewhere, there were drugs openly sold in shops. 
uh, cocaine, other kinds of drugs. It was very normal. Obviously, it was a class issue back then, yes, true. And there was, over time, a realisation this could be used to kind of keep down the lower classes. I think what's changed is the um, criminalisation here of drug use and drugs themselves, which has a lot to do with US pressure post-World War II on Britain, to follow the US line. And sadly, it's been very successful. Um, Sam D asks... How can I take drugs ethically in the present? You're becoming a lifestyle guru here now. I know, rather I yes. Well, it's funny. Journalist. I've got a lot of um, media coverage in the last few months around this book talking about this so called term woke coke, which for anyone who does, I mean, this is ridiculous media creation, essentially, this idea that there are woke people who ethically care about you know, their clothes, their um, food, and they want to have ethically sourced drugs. And I think it's a great idea, but it doesn't exist. There is no way today or tomorrow to get ethically sourced cocaine. It doesn't exist. There are dealers who will say, and they often, now dealers advertise that, saying, you know, I'm in touch with the farmers in Colombia. Well, maybe, but there's no evidence it's really a theme because you have to get it from there to here. What ethically sourced drugs would mean is that everyone along the supply chain is actually given support, is given a job, is given security and safety, which means legalisation. But I think what is going to maybe happen first is in Colombia, for example, this year, the first time ever a senior politician will put forward legislation to legalise coke. It'll fail, certainly, but there is a realisation that if you want to have really ethically sourced drugs or cocaine, the way you need to do it actually is to address it from the source. And, of course, it's finally on that point. What could change radically is synthetically created coke. It is apparently possible. I don't know if it's really being done. I often hear rumours that it is. So if you, for example, can create cocaine in London in a lab, a user would not know the difference between if it's come from Colombia or here, then it could be ethically sourced. The problem is what happens to the people who have suffered for decades in places like Colombia and Peru. Shouldn't they, and I think they should, be in on the system, in on this, on a, on a regulated um, market and not be excluded from it again if a user in London is, for example, accessing Coke from, That's you know... That's a really intriguing question. Presumably, they, I mean, in my book, I talk about, um, it's called uh, molecular, uh, I've got a molecular sort of generation of wines. By, okay. Uh, there's a, a Ava Winery, um, Endless West. Endless West in the United States, they make a bourbon which is a synthetic alcohol. Okay. Uh, or a, 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 have you tried it? I've not tried it. Neither have I. Glyph, I want to get it. I, I want to try it. They, haven't, they don't supply it in the UK. Right. I want to try it. We should do a show one day on, on cellular agriculture and mm. such a huge market. But yeah, the alcohol thing. And obviously like drugs, it's interesting because uh, cellular agriculture makes very little sense with sort of high volume, low margin foodstuffs. Yeah. But if all of a sudden you can say, well, actually I can, I can create a 1938 you know, really expensive wine and it's going to cost me $30, a lot of people are going to pay for that product. It very has. Si- and with, with, similar to drugs. With synthetically, I mean, obviously there's synthetic drugs now, but something like cocaine, if you can produce that, I mean, to me, the vision would be in a legalised, regulated system, the state produces it and sells it and it's regulated. And again, that's good on the one hand because it doesn't have to go through the awful supply chain potentially, but... I do worry that, as I said, the people who have suffered for so long in uh, Latin and South America are excluded. Uh, let's but woke coke is not a thing. Woke coke is one of those stupid <laughs> pseudo phrases from the right. Forget it. Yeah. Joseph O, um, who just asked the last question, uh, also says, really glad to see Navarra broadcast two shows not focused on parliamentary politics. Uh, so am I. <laughs> uh, so am I. This stuff's a lot more interesting than many of the boring people in parliamentary <laughs> politics. However, I think, I think we all agree the, the Labour story over the last four, last four years was a massive one. It's not going away. It's true. The left still needs to take state power as much as it needs to change culture. Final question yeah. uh, from Money Cannot Be Eaten asks, <laughs> is Portugal an ideal model? So I'll reframe that, I guess. You've said in your piece for The Guardian that uh, all drugs should be legalised. Mm. Uh, what would be a good ask in Britain for activists? What, what should we be saying? Portugal? Realistically, you mean? Yeah. Um, I think decriminalisation would be a great start. I think removing any criminal penalties for personal use of all, any drug, heroin, cocaine, cannabis, whatever. Um, a realistic ask which the Tories might introduce, kicking and screaming, but Labour should definitely get behind it, and some many do, safe injecting centres. 
Scotland, the UK, it saves lives. Not one of those centres anywhere in the world, and I discuss this in the book, has anyone died in those facilities. Um, I do think they're all very doable asks. Decriminalisation is the likely first step towards legalisation. Portugal has not moved to legalisation yet. No indication they will. I wish they did, but they haven't. But the effect of, as I said, 20 years has been a pretty amazing success with some faults, but overall amazing success. And the UK, there's no reason at all. And I should say, finally, more and more police around the country in the UK, they've decriminalised drugs de facto anyway. And I spoke to some of them in the book, prominent police, um, heads of police in areas, including in Newcastle, where if you are found with personal possession of heroin, cocaine, whatever, you might get a warning, you're not going to be charged. And that is a model that, I mean, that's not done from backing from Westminster, that's done because the police realise that you can't arrest your way out of the problem. And more and more police have realised, even after my Guardian piece, a policeman, I have this quite a lot, wrote to me and said, mate, a lot of police read that article and said, yeah. In other words, we know that the current system of uh, prohibition is a complete failure. We're waiting for political leadership. And that's been lacking, frankly, with some exceptions, as we know, in both major political parties. Excellent. What a fantastic show. Thank you very Thank much, you. Anthony. How, when are you staying in Britain until? To the weekend. And what are you doing between now and then? I am... Any events that people could go to? Sadly, or? the events have come and gone. I did some earlier this week in London. I hope to come back. Uh, people can find me on all the social medias. Um, I write on a variety of things, including drugs, of course, Israel, Palestine, the joys of uh, US politics, um, disaster capitalism, which is relevant everywhere. And it's actually got worse since I wrote the book five years ago. <laughs> but also some happy stuff. It's a good book. It's a very good book. Thank um, you. That was with Verso. This is with... Scribe, Scribe. which is an Aussie publisher now in the UK and doing very well here. So I'm not giving them a free plug, but they deserve it. They're really good. Hmm. Good. Well, it's a very well put together book, so I can believe that. Thank you. Um, tomorrow, I believe Michael is talking about Sinn Féin. Is that right? And the rise of Sinn Féin uh, yeah. with regards to the Irish election, which is on Saturday. I think that's going to be a really... Well, it's a great show. It's obviously been a great show. Uh, not as evergreen as this because the election's the day after, but I know I don't know enough about Irish politics to really be informed, so looking forward to that. Uh, my name's Aaron Bastani. This has been Anthony Lowenstein. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow night. Good night. Good night.